verse 31, the words of Jesus. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Jump down to verse 41, if you would. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Jumping to verse 46, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. For the last few weeks, we've been sharing about things unseen. Paul said, we fix our eyes on the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal. Beyond this physical world that we can experience with our senses, there is an unseen realm. It's populated by spiritual beings, by angels, both holy and fallen, and demons. We've been talking about those for the last few weeks. Heaven is in the unseen realm, and so is hell. Do you know, in over 20 years of preaching the gospel, I have never before given a sermon entirely on hell. If this is your first time here, if you've never heard me before, you hit the jackpot today. All along the way, I've affirmed the reality of hell. I've pled with people to embrace Jesus and escape hell. But I've never devoted an entire sermon to taking an in-depth look at hell. Do you know, in the last 20 to 30 years, there has been a steady trend towards making light of heaven and hell. Among believers and unbelievers alike. Among unbelievers, hell is just a big joke. One popular notion is that hell is going to be one giant pyrotechnic dance party. An ongoing orgy where hedonists can enjoy every sort of vice free from the criticisms of prudish, Bible-thumping Christians. Let them go on and sit on a cloud and play a harp if they want to. I'd rather go party with the devil in hell. Nothing could possibly be further from the truth about hell. There will be no parties there. There will be no pleasures there. There will be no good times there or anything to make one feel good. Others spoof hell as a place of inconveniences and ironic punishments. There was one funny commercial a little while back ago where a middle-aged man dies and he is seen, shown to his delight a beautiful hot sports car and he's all ready to get into it and then he is turned around and he discovers that his eternal punishment is to drive a minivan forever. As a middle-aged man who drives a minivan, I can totally relate. You know, those are actually amusing ways of commenting about the quirks of life here, but they have absolutely nothing to do with the realities of hell. Even among believers, there has been a tendency to make light of heaven and hell. Gospel preaching has changed a lot since I was a kid, Carla. Do you know that being sure of your eternal destiny was a constant thing? theme of sermons once. We were often warned with tears that there is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. But somewhere along the way, preaching about heaven and hell has fallen out of fashion. It has been categorized by some as spiritual milk for spiritual babes. The emphasis of preaching has shifted entirely to the experience of our Christian life here on earth. Preaching about heaven and especially about hell has been belittled as old-fashioned fire and brimstone preaching. It's been criticized as manipulative, playing upon people's deepest fears. I've heard things said like, well, you know, salvation is more than just fire insurance. 
as if escaping hell is not a genuine enough motive for embracing Christ. But I want to tell you, beloved, it totally is. What could possibly be more important in this life than to ensure that we escape hell and that we gain access to heaven? It's not spiritual milk for spiritual babes. It's not scare tactics. It is the essence of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him should not perish in hell for eternity, but shall have everlasting life in heaven. You might find it interesting to learn that most of what we know about hell came from the lips of Jesus himself. And that makes sense. The idea of a hell that involves some kind of eternal punishment at the hands of a just and holy God is so profoundly difficult for us to handle emotionally that the only person who would have enough authority to convince us of the reality of such a place is Jesus himself. And listen, Jesus totally used the fear of hell as a motivating force to, to encourage people to embrace him and gain the salvation that comes through him. Luke and Paul and John and Peter and the other New Testament writers also use the fear of hell to motivate people to embrace Christ and to cling to him for the rest of their lives. The life of persevering faith that the New Testament calls for has very little to do with our outcomes here. It has everything to do with our eternal destiny. We live in patient faith in Christ over here so as to gain eternal life over there. Don't be mistaken, beloved. The teaching of Jesus and the rest of the New Testament is fully intended to scare the hell out of you. As our friend Jackson Sinyanga says, I don't say this to frighten you. I say this to terrify you. So with that in mind, I want to share three truths about hell this morning. Three truths about hell. The first truth is this. Hell is a horrible place. Hell is a horrible place. There are many people who doubt the existence of hell. Even many believers wrestle with the doctrine of hell, even though they firmly believe in heaven. But the Bible teaches that hell is indeed a real place. Jesus said that God created hell to be the final place of punishment for the devil and for fallen angels and for demons. Jesus also said that hell will be the final place of punishment for every person who rejects him. Beloved, hell is not merely a metaphor for, for bad earthly experiences. It's not a metaphor for extreme human suffering. We talk about hell on earth, but hell isn't on earth. It's a real place that exists in the realm of unseen things. The most horrific suffering on earth pales in comparison to the suffering in hell. Hell is a place of complete and permanent separation from God. You know, on the surface, that might not sound so bad because there are millions and millions of unbelievers who already live on earth separated from God. But although they're separated from Him by their sin, yet His blessings still surround them. They're still the recipients and the beneficiaries of His common grace. Paul preached about that in Lystra and in Athens. Even though people are separated from God, he still extends his love and his care to them. God has given the gift of life to every man. He's given them a country and a place to call home. He's given them a family and a circle of friends. He's given them provision. Jesus said that God sends the blessing of rain on both the just and the unjust. God has given every man the light of human consciousness and conscience. He's given every man a measure of faith. While they walk in darkness, they still have some light that is derived from God. We're all recipients of those blessings and fully reliant upon them, whether we realize it or not. 
Paul said God did this so that perhaps men might reach out and touch him because he's not far from any one of us. Yet in spite of all these tender mercies, in spite of all these loving kindnesses and care, people don't reach out for God. They're not grateful. They're not thankful. They show him no honor. They offer him no worship. They give him no obedience. The suffering here on earth cannot begin to compare with the extreme suffering in hell because no matter how severe earthly suffering is, it is still tempered by God's mercy. Even though unbelievers are, are separated from God by their sin, still there is a sense in which he is with each one of us. In him we live and move and have our being. In hell, all such tendernesses, all such blessings, all such loving mercies will be completely removed. And we have no concept of how horrible a place like that would be. Even the concentration camps can't compare. Even the killing fields of war can't compare. Even the savage brutalities of guerrillas and dictators can't compare. Hell is a place of extreme mental and emotional anguish. Let's dispel this notion that heaven will be boring and hell will be fun. Jesus said that in hell there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of unbearable sorrow that is inescapable. Lost souls in hell will suffer in utter isolation. Jesus described hell as the state of outer darkness. Have you ever experienced complete darkness? I mean, can't see your hand in front of your face darkness? Last spring, Denise and I took the kids on a tour of an abandoned gold mine in Arizona. And our guide explained to us that each miner was rationed one Roman candle per day. The men worked in teams of two, but they would only burn one candle at a time so that both of their candles might make it to the end of their shift. And to conserve their candles, at lunchtime they would extinguish the candle and they would sit in utter darkness. Our guide switched off the lights for a minute to give us a sample of what that felt like. It was the longest minute of my life. Lauren grabbed my hand and about squeezed it right off the end of my arm. Utter darkness is terrifying. It's immobilizing. All around us there were pickaxes and lanterns and samples of old mining tools. And in the dark we didn't want to move a muscle for fear of running into something or tripping over something. That's what hell is like. The Bible calls it gross darkness. But you know, our experience in the mine shaft doesn't even begin to compare because we had the comfort of knowing that the lights would come back on again. We had control over the darkness, but in hell, souls exist in total darkness forever and ever. They have eyes that continually peer into the blackness, but they will never see anything again. The lights will never come on again. The darkness will never diminish. Our one minute in the mine doesn't compare either because even though we couldn't see each other, we were still comforted by each other's presence. I could still feel Lolly's hands and she could feel mine. We could still hear each other and encourage one another. But hell is not like that. Outer darkness is the state of utter isolation. There is no friendship in hell. I grew up watching the sitcom Laverne and Shirley. Anybody old enough to remember that show? Laverne and Shirley used to have a little ditty that they sang to each other as besties. If in heaven we don't meet, side by side we'll bear the heat. And if it ever gets too hot, Pepsi Cola hits the spot. But can I tell you, that's not what hell is like. Lost souls in hell will suffer alone without ever knowing again the comfort of human companionship. 
There will be no interactions of any kind with another person. There will be no communication. There will be no one to hear you and you will hear no one. There will be no human touches. I think about Helen Keller's description of her early childhood. Blind and deaf and mute, her thoughts and her feelings were locked up inside of the prison of her own mind. She talks about the utter frustration of not being able to communicate with anybody. She talks about the rage that she felt as just a small child. That will be the frustration and the torment of lost souls in hell. Jesus said they will gnash their teeth. And yet Helen Keller's experience still doesn't compare to the horrors of hell. She was still aware of her parents' presence. She was still aware of, of their efforts to soothe her. In hell, there will be no such offer of comfort. There will be no gestures of relief. There will be no offers of solidarity. There will be no camaraderie. There will be no sense of we're in this together. Lost souls in hell will long to connect with someone, but they will never be able to. Experts in human health and behavior say that the greatest psychological torture that can ever be inflicted on a person is solitary confinement. Prisoners would rather brave the dangers of living among the general population than to face the torment of solitary. You see, God created us to be social. He created us for fellowship. He created us for friendship. He created us to thrive in a community. God said it is not good for man to be alone. Isolation causes extreme mental anguish and emotional anguish. It drives men mad. All alone in the darkness, lost souls in hell will experience gut-wrenching sorrow and bitter regret. Jesus taught in Luke 16 that lost souls in hell will be painfully aware that they passed up on the opportunity to embrace salvation and escape hell. They'll vividly remember every act of defiance against God. They'll vividly remember every wrong that they ever committed against others. They'll recall every critical juncture in their lives when they rejected a pursuit of God and righteousness and opted for a life of self-satisfaction and pleasure. They'll remember every time that they turned a deaf ear to the gospel. They'll be keenly aware of every instance when God tried to get their attention, when he tugged on their heart, when he wooed and he warned but they refused him. All alone in the darkness, they'll keep mentally reviewing their lives and they'll want to kick themselves again and again for being so callous and stubborn and short-sighted. But there will be no remedy. No apology can be offered. No amends can be made. In hell, the anguish of bitter regret will never be assuaged. Jesus taught that lost souls in hell will be tormented by the happiness of the saints in heaven. They'll be consciously aware that believers that they once mocked are now happy in heaven. They'll be aware that believers whose witnesses they refused are experiencing delight in the presence of Jesus. They'll be aware that those that they despised are now seated in places of honor. And this knowledge will bring unbearable sorrow and regret. Jesus taught that lost souls in hell will be tormented by the sorrow that their loved ones are lost too. They'll be keenly aware of their family members that are suffering all alone. They'll be keenly aware that their friends are suffering all alone. They'll especially recall those moments that they led others away from faith and into sin. They'll recall how they discouraged their spouses from pursuing God. They'll recall how they discouraged their children from pursuing God. They'll recall how they persuaded their friends and seduced them into sin that became snares that prevented them from receiving salvation. Jesus taught that lost souls in hell will be tormented by the lost potential of their lives. They'll realize all their lives could have been and the good that they could have done if only they had accepted Christ. The utter waste, the utter ruin of their lives and the lives of so many others will cause agonizing regret. Revelation 14 says they shall have no rest day or night. 
Hell is also a place of extreme physical suffering. Along with outer darkness and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, Jesus said that hell is a place of scorching fire. It's a place of sweltering heat and unquenchable thirst. Jesus in the New Testament talks about hellfire over and over again. And you know there's really no reason to take fire metaphorically. But even if we did take it metaphorically, what could the metaphors mean besides a punishment of suffering? To be honest with you, the reality that those symbols point to are far worse than the symbols themselves. Jesus said at the end there will be a resurrection of all the dead in immortal bodies that are capable of feeling pain. The wicked will be cast into hell. Externally, their flesh will constantly burn but never be consumed. Internally, they'll be devoured by worms. Jesus said, the fire is never quenched and the worms that eat them will never die. Revelation says, the smoke of their torment will never go out. Hell will be full of putrid smells, burning flesh and sulfur and acrid smoke. You say, Pastor Glenn, you're trying to scare us. Yes, yes, I am. Hell is also a place of terrifying demonic torment. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 35, that lost souls in hell will be turned over to be tormented by demons. I believe this will be both mental and physical. I believe that they'll taunt lost souls again and again and remind them of their stubborn stupidity and their missed opportunities and their failures. In utter darkness, they will claw and bite and thrash and terrorize. Hell is a place of varying degrees of punishment. Jesus said that hell will not be the same for everyone. Some will receive more, punish, more severe punishment than others. You know, we talk about the fact that all sins, whether great or small, render men guilty before God, and that's true. All men are equally guilty of sin and in need of salvation, but not all men are equal in their guilt. Just like there are degrees of honor and reward in heaven. Wouldn't you rather talk about heaven? I'm going to talk about heaven next week. It's going to be glory. In fact, I want you to do something. I want you to, if you can remember, I want you to wear blue. I want you to wear something bright blue next week because blue is the color of heaven. Just like there are degrees of honor and reward in heaven, so there will be degrees of punishment in hell. Punishment in hell will vary according to people's deeds in this life. It's true that we cannot be saved by works, but works are not immune to God's judgment. Solomon said God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or evil. Jesus said in Luke 12, verses 47 and 48, that some in hell will be beaten with fewer blows and some will be beaten with more blows. Hell will be very hot. For Hitler. Hell will be hot for Stalin. Hell will be hot for Idi Amin, who slaughtered millions and millions of his own people. Hell will be hot for Pol Pot, who slaughtered millions in Cambodia. Hell will be hot for Saddam and Osama. It'll be hot for Gaddafi and Kim Jong il and Bashir Assad. Jesus said, Hell will be hot for people who abuse and violate children. He said that it would be better for them if they had never been born. Hell will be hot for people who seduce others into sin. Hell will be hot for pimps and pushers. The Bible says that people who held positions of leadership and authority will be held into a greater account. Politicians who looked straight into television cameras and lied through their teeth will be held more accountable. But lest we get smug, church, there's another sobering truth. Punishment in hell will vary according to the amount of spiritual light that people had. Jesus said that those who receive more spiritual light will be held more accountable. He told the people of Bethsaida and Chorazan and Capernaum that they would receive more severe punishment than the people even of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because they had the light of Christ's miracles, they had the light of his teaching, they had the, the joy of his presence, and still they rejected him. 
the wicked people of Nineveh repented, but the holy people of Jerusalem would not. Jesus said it would be better for Judas if he had never been born. Those who have heard the gospel more often will be held accountable than those who did not. And listen, those who preach the gospel and lead the church but live secret lives of unfaithfulness to Christ will be held in greater account. That scares the hell out of me. Beloved, listen, hell is no joke. It's nothing to make light of. It's nothing to minimize or ignore or dismiss. Hell is a horrible place. Three truths about hell. A second truth I find. Hell is a necessary place. Hell is a necessary place. You doing all right this morning? Can I get you anything? We need a little lemonade, a little... They asked for coffee in the first service. All right, listen. Hell is a necessary place. Without a doubt, hell is the most difficult truth in the entire Bible. Through the history of the church, Christians have struggled with hell. Some church fathers and theologians have offered alternatives to the biblical doctrine of hell along the way. But let me just say, it does not matter what anyone else has said about hell. All that matters is what Jesus and the Bible say about hell. Still, it bothers us to think that God himself could create a place that's so horrible. It's well enough, I suppose, to send the devil and fallen angels and demons there. But how could God send human beings there to languish forever without relief or remedy? What about all the people that seem to us like basically good people but don't know Jesus? I mean, Hitler we can understand, Stalin we can understand, but what about my neighbor? What about my coworker, the, the people around me that are basically salt of the earth kind of people? How could a loving God send innocent people to hell? You know, that's a, a frequently asked question. But if you think about it for a minute, you might realize that such a question is outrageously presumptuous. For one thing, that question presumes that we have either the right or the ability to examine God. On a couple of occasions, the Pharisees invited Jesus to dinner parties to examine him, to question him, to weigh him, to pass judgment about him. They sat at a level table across from Jesus. They made him their equal. As if men have ever had the right to make God the subject of our intellectual inquiries. As if God could be measured and weighed and understood and vindicated and approved by any rubric of our making. God said, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Job had some troubling questions for God. So God came and he said, okay, Job, you want to go mano y mano with me? Bring it, bro. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When I marked off its dimensions? When I set its footings and laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together? Will you contend with the Almighty? Will you correct him? Will you accuse God of injustice? Yeah, after about two chapters of talk like that, Job was shaking in his boots. He said, surely, God, I spoke of things that I do not understand, things that are too wonderful for me. God said to Isaiah, does the clay have any right to say to the potter, why are you doing this or why are you doing that? Paul recalls those same words in Romans 9 when he's talking about God's dealings with men. He said, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall a created being say to its creator, why did you make me like this? How could a loving God send innocent people to hell? That question presumes that God is capable of doing something wrong. But the Bible says that God is absolutely incapable of doing anything immoral. He's incapable of doing anything unjust. He's incapable of acting outside of his love, even when his actions seem severe to us. He's incapable of acting in any way that's inconsistent with his own divine character and nature. He's incapable of making a mistake. 
Why is it that we're so quick to defend the moral character of men who have only been bad, but doubt the moral character of God who has only been good? That's good preaching right there. You ought to get the tape because you missed it the first time. Listen, before the severe judgment that fell on the city of Sodom, the angel cried out, Will not the righteous judge of all the earth do right? When the devil and his fallen angels and demons are thrown into hell in Revelation, the angels cry out, All his judgments are true and just. David said the Lord is righteous in all his ways. From the beginning to the end, every action of God is just. Every action of God is fair and right and good. Listen, we would do well to remember that when we pose certain questions or log certain complaints or levy certain charges. We need to be careful that we're not making an indictment against the character of God. If people go to hell, then God is right and just and good in his judgments that resulted in their placement there. How can a loving God send innocent people to hell? That question presumes that there is some kind of conflict between God's love and his justice as if punishing the sins of mankind is an unloving act on God's part, but it isn't. Beloved, the holiness of God is not subservient to his love. God is holy just as he is love. He is not more of one than the other. He is equally both. He is not sometimes loving and sometimes just. He is both at all times. And his love and his holiness are not at odds with each other. When God is just, he is being loving. On the cross, both the love and the justice of God were on full display. That's good preaching right there. How could a loving God send innocent people to hell? That question presumes that innocence is a possibility for some and that we could identify them. The Bible says, In Adam all have spiritually died. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous. No, not one. We say, oh, but he's such a good person, but she's such a good person. But the Bible says all our righteous deeds are like dirty rags. I think we've forgotten that there's a difference between valuable and good. The Bible says that all people are infinitely valuable, but people are not inherently good. Who are we to say that anyone is innocent or that someone may be innocent when the Bible clearly says no one is innocent? Listen, even as believers, we, we hold on tightly to sentimentalities that are at odds with what the Bible says. We say, but she has such a good heart. How do we presume to know the contents of anyone's heart when God says that he alone knows the heart? In fact, the Bible says in Jeremiah, we don't know our own hearts. We're easily self-deceived. So maybe the real problem is that we just don't take sin very seriously. Maybe the real problem is that we don't regard sin as the affront to God that it is. Maybe we don't really believe that its consequences are deadly serious. So the question of innocence is a non-starter. How could a loving God send innocent people to hell is not a legitimate question. Perhaps a legitimate question might be, how could a loving God send ignorant people to hell? What about those who have never heard the gospel? I would just give you three things very quickly. First, as we've already said, God always does right, and he's only capable of doing so. Secondly, We've said that God judges people according to the light that they had, and how he does that is his business. And thirdly, I would point out that Paul said no one has a valid excuse for being lost. Only God knows in what ways he's moved in the hearts of every man and woman. Only God knows how he has whispered and wooed and warned. Only God knows what messengers he has sent. There are two deviations from Orthodox Christian doctrine 
about hell that are rapidly becoming popular in America among evangelicals. One of them is universalism, and the other is annihilationism. Universalism says that all men will be saved in the very end. It teaches that the blood of Jesus was effective to forgive the sins of the whole world, and that all people will eventually come to realize that either in this life or in the next. One variation on universalism is the idea that hell is a real but a temporary place of punishment. That the purpose of hell is to bring people to repentance and before the great white throne of judgment, everyone will realize that Jesus is Lord. Can I tell you the words of Jesus? Don't permit it. One popular version of annihilationism also sees hell as real but temporary. It says that after the final judgment, the wicked will simply cease to exist, but the redeemed will live on forever and ever in heaven. But listen to me, beloved. The contrast that Jesus makes is not between eternal life versus non-existence. The contrast that Jesus makes is between a destiny of eternal blessing in heaven or a destiny of eternal punishment in hell. Hell is necessary. It's necessary to make sense of the words of Jesus and that of the rest of the Bible. If hell is not what we have said, then Jesus was mistaken. He was wrong. Hell is necessary to complete the story of fallen creatures. It's necessary to punish Satan for his personal rebellion against God, for his leadership of a revolt in heaven, and for his seduction of mankind. It's necessary to punish the fallen angels and their, the demons for their rebellion against God and their cruel harassment of people. It's necessary for God to punish men for their rebellion against him and for leading other men in rebellion. It's necessary for him to punish their unrepentant sins against him and against others. On our thousand-hour trip home from Kuala Lumpur, we had two stopovers. One was in Hong Kong and the second one was in Toronto. And while we were waiting for our connection, I heard the most horrible story. Two married people had an affair with one another. And they decided that they wanted to be together permanently, but they wanted to find a way for each of them to retain all the assets from their existing marriages. So they got an idea and they both booked cruises with their spouses on the same ship. And while they were at sea in international waters, they helped one another eliminate their spouses. Both spouses disappeared without a trace. And the Canadian government is in a conundrum because they're unsure about how to investigate and prosecute. They don't know if anybody has or who has jurisdiction because it happened in international waters. It appears that they may get away with it, but hell is hot. No lesser punishment would do for so much evil and gross sin of humanity. No lesser punishment would do for so much rebellion against God from the devil down to man and all the creatures in between. Hell is necessary to complete the story of so great a salvation. Hell is necessary to vindicate the faithfulness of the holy angels that remained loyal to God during their period of testing and probation. Hell is necessary to vindicate the life of faith and obedience and patient suffering of the saints on earth. It's necessary to vindicate the blood of the martyrs who laid down their lives for Jesus' sake. Hell is necessary to justify the death of God's only Son who paid the price of His innocent blood. Hell is necessary to uphold the righteousness and the glory of God. Everybody look at me for one moment. Listen to this. Catch this. In heaven, the holy angels and the saints of God worship God for all of his righteous deeds and all of his just acts. God's just judgments evoke in heaven awe and reverence and honor and worship among us, his people here on earth. Let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Let's let God's righteous deeds and his just judgments inspire on our part more love for him and not disdain or disgust or doubt. That's good preaching right there. 
Three truths about hell. Hell is a horrible place. Hell is a necessary place. And finally this, hell is a forever place. Hell is a forever place. Worship team, come and help me. As a tree falls, so a tree lies. As a man lives, so a man dies. As a man dies, so shall he be throughout the course of eternity. The Bible's use of the word saved begs a question from us. Saved from what? Jesus took on a body of human flesh. God himself became something substantively that he previously was not. He was forever changed by the event of the incarnation. He humbled himself. He was made a little lower than the angels. He came to earth as a man. He was born of a virgin. He loved and he lived among us as a servant. He went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. He was betrayed by one of his own disciples. He was rejected by his own people, and he was crucified on a Roman cross. He took upon him the sins of the entire world. His innocent blood was poured out on the ground to pay the price of our redemption, a, a, an eternity of unbroken fellowship that existed among the Godhead was broken in that moment on the cross when the Father turned His face away from the Son. He was buried in a tomb. He rose again on the third day, defeating death and hell and the grave. Beloved, listen to me. Jesus died to save us from something more than just ourselves. He died to save us from something more than a life here on earth that falls short of its full potential. Jesus died on the cross to save us from the most gruesome, terrifying fate imaginable. He died to save us from a destiny of torment in hell that will never end. Hell is an unspeakably horrible place, and it is horrible for all of eternity. It's separation from the love and kindness of God forever. It's isolation and utter blackness forever. It's extreme mental anguish forever. It's extreme physical suffering forever. It's terrifying demonic torment forever. The very same word eternal that the Bible uses to describe the eternal God, the eternal spirit, the eternal sacrifice, the eternal covenant, the eternal gospel, eternal salvation, eternal life, eternal kingdom, eternal habitation, eternal inheritance, eternal glory. That same word the Bible also uses to describe eternal sin eternal judgment, eternal punishment, eternal damnation, eternal darkness, eternal destruction, eternal fire, eternal torment. Look at me. These are not my words. They're the words of God in the Bible. Paul said he will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. Revelation says the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. They will have no rest day or night. Jesus said the worm that eats them will never die and the fire will never go out. Three horrible truths about hell. It's a horrible place. It's a necessary place. And it's a forever place. So what shall we do with hell? What shall we do with the most sobering doctrine 
in the entire Bible, very quickly, three things. Number one, the truth about hell should motivate us to make our salvation sure. Peter said, make every effort to make your calling and your election sure. Paul said, I believe in God that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked, so I strive to always keep my conscience clear before God and man. The truth about hell should motivate you to make sure that you know, that you know, that you know that you will escape hell and you're going to heaven. There's only one way to do that. That's through Jesus. Listen, you can't work hard enough. You can't do enough good deeds. You can't try hard enough. There's only one way. It's through putting your faith in Jesus and receiving the washing that he gives. Here's the good news. You don't have to go to hell. Jesus has made a way to heaven. What shall we do with hell? Number two, the truth about hell should make us infinitely more grateful to God every day for our salvation. Can I tell you, we're an ungrateful lot. We're a complaining bunch. We get set back so easily. The truth of what God has saved us from should make us thank Him more. It should make us more joyful. It should make us worship Him more. You know, it should make us more steady in the storms of life. I know that devastating things do happen. I know that the pain and the suffering in life is real, but when we're going through it, we can say, thank God, no matter how bad it is, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven someday. What should we do with the truth about hell? Finally, this. The truth about hell should motivate us to pray for, to plead with, to witness to, to warn the people in our lives to embrace Jesus and to escape the flames of hell. Hell is such a horrible place. We don't want anyone to go there. God says in his word, do you think I take any delight in the destruction of the wicked? The Bible says that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to know him, that everyone should receive this eternal life. We don't want anyone to go there. We don't want our sons or our daughters to go there. We don't want our grandchildren. We don't want our family. We don't want our friends to go there. We don't want our neighbors or co-workers to go there. You know what? Even the people we don't like, even the people that tick us off or have done us wrong, we don't want them to go there. What shall we do with hell? Would you stand together this morning? And I want you to give a great big prayer. We ought to be more joyful. We ought to be more steady in the storms of this life. Jesus has rescued us from hell. And he's opened up the way of salvation to live forever in heaven with him. Would you bow your heads all over this place with me? We have to go. Our time is well over. But this is so important. We can't go before I ask this question. While your heads are bowed all over this place, do you know that 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 you have escaped hell and that you're on your way to heaven. Hebrews says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Do you know that you know? If you're sure that you're going to escape hell, why are you sure? On what basis? There is only one way. It's not through your own efforts or your own good deeds only through the blood of Jesus. Are you sure? You know, for those of us who have received Christ, the Spirit is inside of us and it bears witness with our spirit that we're saved, that we're born again, that we're going to heaven. Do you have that assurance? And if you don't know, what could possibly be more important than making sure that you're going to escape hell and that you're going to go to heaven. Listen, a decision not to make a decision is a decision. A decision not to receive Jesus is a decision to reject him 
for all of eternity. While heads are bowed, if there's someone here and you're not sure and you want to be sure, I'm going to lead you in a prayer to make sure. I'm going to lead you in a prayer today to receive Jesus, to receive that cleansing of his blood, to receive that washing. I'm going to lead you in a prayer that's going to help you leave the kingdom of darkness and enter the kingdom of the beloved son. While your heads are bowed all over this place, if you want to pray that prayer with me and make sure, I want you to lift your hand up very high and we're going to pray together. Come on. There's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, there's five, six, seven, eight. I can't count. Nine, I see. There's ten. Come on. Is there someone else? There's another one. I want to make sure. I want to make sure there's another one. Come on, is there someone else? I want to make sure. I want to make absolutely sure. Lift up your hand high. Come on, put it up high. I want to make sure. I want to make sure. There's another one. I want to make sure. I want to be absolutely certain. There's another one way in the back. I want to be absolutely certain. Come on, someone else. Do you know that you know that you know? Here's how you know if you know. The Spirit of God is bearing witness inside of you. Yeah, I, I'm His. I'm my beloved. He's mine. Then you know. If you don't know, what could possibly be more important? Anybody else? Lift up your hand high. Anyone else? Lift up your hand high. Let's all lift up our hands together. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. I want everyone to pray with me, if you would, please. For those of us that are born again, and we know that we are, it feels so good to say this prayer every time, to give our lives to Jesus again. Lift up your hands all over this place. Come on, let's pray. I'll lead and you follow. Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I need you. I've sinned. I've fallen short of God's glory. I've defied God. I've disobeyed. Jesus, wash me. Forgive my sins. Break the power of sin over my life. Jesus, Make me a new person. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I don't want to go to hell. I want to live forever in heaven. Jesus, I receive you now as my Lord and the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give a big praise to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. sorry that there's another service because I feel like having a big party right now. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We'll do it at the end of the next service. All right, listen to me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to come forward and our pastors are going to meet you here. There's something we want to give you and we want to pray and celebrate with you. Let me say this to you. Last night we had time to do it. We can't do it today, but I want you to pray. Say a prayer today. We don't want anyone in our family to go to hell. We don't want any moms and dads. I don't care how successful your kids are. I don't care if they're doctors or lawyers. I don't care if they're rich, famous, wildly successful. What does it profit a man if they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? Let's say a prayer today for the people in our family, for our loved ones who don't know Jesus. Let's pray. Listen, James says that you were saved to be the first fruits in your family. So if you're the first believer in your family, God saved you to be the first. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved and your whole house. God saved you to be the first fruits and God's going to give you the grace, the wherewithal. He's going to give you the, the opportunity to speak a word, to sow a seed of salvation. And I want you to just start by praying for that right now. So come on, put, join your hands together. Please don't forget the offering for our dear friend, Melissa. Let's bless her real good and give the best offering that we can to help her with her uh, next leg of her journey in California. Meet Pastor Bobby. He's wearing a bright purple shirt. So find him out there and just say hi to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you now for this time in your presence. Lord, as we go our own way, I pray the cloud of your presence would envelop us. 
Lord, let your protection surround us. Let your provision accompany us. Let your providence lead us and your peace encircle us until we come together. And everyone said, amen. God bless you, everyone. Have a great week. Next week, we're going to talk about heaven. Wear something blue next week. God bless you.